There is really no good segue to where I want to go next to start us off, which is September 11th, 2001. Those of us who worked in the New York office of Human Rights Watch at the time on that day and were in the office early had uh, an unfortunate front row seat to see what was happening downtown, at least until we ourselves were evacuated from the 34th floor of the Empire State Building because it was figured that we would be the next targets. One of the things that I'll never forget about that morning was the reaction of the old hands, my colleagues at Human Rights Watch, who understood instantly, even before we knew the details of the act that, that was in front of us, that, as they said, this was the end of human rights work as we knew it. If this was an attack on U.S. soil, they knew that the administration of George W. Bush would turn our country into the United States of vengeance, we would soon be at war, and human rights protections would not be high on anybody's list. They got it right away. Uh, it really was impressive to me. They knew that that day and its aftermath would indelibly alter the space in which progressive civil society would be able to operate. I happened to be in the office early that Tuesday morning because I was to present to the Board of Directors of Human Rights Watch the progress of the new program on HIV and human rights. You will remember that just a few months earlier in June of 2001 was the first UN General Assembly special session on HIV in which a remarkably good Canadian delegation that actually included Ralph Jurgens, maybe also some of you in the room, uh, and a number of other progressive country delegations managed to win the day over an in inexperienced Bush team and produce a declaration of commitment that was heavy with human rights language. It even included a commitment to harm reduction in those words, those words that would become anathema to the Bush administration later on. The Global Fund had been set up by that time, itself a result of human rights-based advocacy, at least in my view. It seemed like something of a high moment. And as we were being evacuated from the Empire State Building, I was thinking, of course, of my friends who lived downtown, but I was also thinking that these achievements might well founder and we would not be able to sustain a human rights effort around HIV. My colleagues at Human Rights Watch were in many ways prescient, and I was not. Progressive civil society indeed across the world, especially organizations working on socioeconomic development and human rights, I think, found themselves quickly in a transformed environment, which continues to this day in many ways, and not all of them linked to September 11th. Many NGOs became victims of funding that flowed abandoning anti-poverty work and human rights work in favor of security and counter-terrorism work, or they found themselves in situations of pure co-optation working with or beside the, the military in some cases, or they found themselves pressured to do service delivery of various kinds rather than advocacy of any edgy kind, or they were excluded if they resisted any of that, and certainly many uh, were pressured to drop any partnerships with organizations that were tarred by the very wide brush of being called terrorists. And that's not even to speak of the larger impact on civil society of the complete devaluing of civil rights, privacy rights, due process where national security demanded it, which became the new mantra everywhere, and the generalized fear of protesting those dangerous changes. Of course, there's nothing new about the politicization of development aid, but this all seemed to be of another order. For the documentation of these phenomena, which have really fascinated me, I have to say, we are greatly in the debt of academic experts such as Jude Howell at the London School of Economics, Mark Duffield at the University of Bristol, um, Alan Fowler from South Africa, who's now at Erasmus, I think, in the Netherlands, because relatively few NGOs themselves have been willing or able to tell the full story of how the securitization of development assistance, as Professor Howell of LSE calls it, has changed their way of doing business. Compounding the security and the anti-terrorism issues, of course, was the new political power of religious fundamentalists, by which I certainly include Christian fundamentalists in the U.S. government. 
So progressive civil society coming through this difficult period took another hit, I think you might say, in the global financial crisis, as of course have the poor themselves. Some scholars have suggested that the financial crisis caught anti-poverty and human rights NGOs sleeping. If so, they were certainly in good company. How, after all, does an anti-poverty NGO deal with, again, less funding for anti-poverty work, coupled with the ease with which societies across the world have swallowed this narrative of banks too big to fail? What do you do when you're an anti-poverty NGO and you have to watch the biggest transfers of capital from workers to management in the post-colonial history? the wholesale slashing of benefits to the poor while the rich get richer, and again, an atmosphere of fear if you decide to go against all of that grain. And so we gallop together into this unprecedented period of economic inequality with the champagne, the champagne glass graph of inequality from 2007 having only become much more skewed since then. But what's remarkable to me, and really I think uh, is worth noting, is that somehow in this same period that we're talking about since about 2000, there has been really considerable victories in the area of HIV and human rights. I do not want to exaggerate the matter, uh, and since our struggles continue obviously and perhaps our hard times are now coming upon us, I don't know. But it certainly is true that strides were made in our field over this time that have eluded others in progressive human rights efforts. Of course, by, by 2001, many elements of the HIV-centered advocacy or movement, if you like, had a pretty good start. The remarkable North-South partnership on access to affordable medicine, which is in many ways to me perhaps the most successful and lasting part of this work, though of course still a work in progress, and I'll say that a thousand times I'm sure, was already gaining strength. And this is to me again remarkable, and its, its subsequent uh, strengths are remarkable because they are based so much on direct challenges to these forces of global capital that are plainly winning on other fronts. Even if the needed reforms to the Canadian access to medicines regime were tragically not supported in the House of Commons last year, the work that many of you have done over the years with your counterparts around the world in this area has as its legacy, I think, in many ways, the existence of the Global Fund, the existence of UNITAID. Now, a vast body of jurisprudence as Indian, Thai, Brazilian, South African, even occasionally European courts have, on human rights grounds, echoed your challenges to unjust intellectual property protections. Part of this legacy, as well, is a greater capacity to recognize and respond to the newer shenanigans of Big Pharma, uh, such as the, the one that still amazes to shock me every time I think of it, the cynical use of anti-counterfeiting regulations to limit access to generic medicines as well as an important global debate about alternatives to traditional patent regimes that even has reached the World Health Assembly. And it is now happening with respect to medicines for a wide range of conditions, not just HIV. It's a remarkable legacy. Other parts of the HIV and human rights effort also had the solidity of a pre-2001 history. Gays and lesbians, even before the era of HIV, had galvanized in North America and eventually, of course, globally, what by any reckoning must be one of the most important and exemplary human rights efforts of our lifetime. And by 2001, the rights of people not to be discriminated based on HIV, against based on HIV status, and not to be subjected to abusive practices in HIV testing, while yes, not complete successes, still something that we fight for, had strong coalitions around them, and people living with HIV were finding their way around the health policy table to a striking degree that hadn't been seen before in global health, and I know I've been kicking around it a long time. So many of you are here this weekend, as I don't have to say, because of a part of the HIV and human rights struggle that I think has enjoyed less success, the misapplication of criminal law to elements of human behavior, let's call them sex and drugs, that are linked to HIV exposure and transmission. What I'd really like to do this evening in the time remaining is to reflect on whether there are lessons 
from other parts of human rights advocacy on HIV and other parts maybe of human rights advocacy more broadly that are helpful to our thinking about the criminal law related challenges that are left to us. I have to say with, you know, as I see all your faces in the room and all of you who've done such fantastic work in this area for so long, I just hope that my thinking on this subject will not be so banal that you've already thought of it all before, but I push on anyway. Um, and to me, it's been useful in thinking about this and preparing for tonight that uh, to, to go back or to, to, to dip my toe anyway into the history of human rights, which is a relatively young discipline. It is commonplace in teaching human rights at the university level to say that today's human rights regime descends, at least in some defensible sense, from Lockean ideas about the natural rights of man and also from the French and American revolutions. After all, we need only look at the declarations from those revolutions and later at the US Constitution to see antecedents of the precise wording of elements of human rights treaties. So this idea was kind of shaken up a few years ago by an intellectual historian at Columbia University called Samuel Moyne, whose 2010 book, The Last Utopia, I certainly recommend to your reading. I hope you'll indulge me a few minutes to talk about some of his ideas, not because they're the only ones out there, and if you read the reviews of this book, you will see that they are not without controversy, but because I think some of what he lays out helps to shape our thinking about the challenge at hand. So in Moyne's view, this idea that of descending from the French and American Revolution, the human, today's human rights movement as the intellectual offspring of those 18th century revolutions is a misconstruction of history. He, and I fondly hope that I do not do injustice to his ideas. As he asserts, those declarations from those revolutions were more than anything else declarations of the right to self-determination. The right to self-determination is not an individual right. Our current regime is based on individual rights. Unless we're happy with the idea that each person has the right to declare him or herself a state. I think we've probably all met people who are inclined to that sort of thing. The 18th century revolutions in Moyne's formulation were thus, and I quote from him, Wholly, wholly compatible with the spread of national sovereignty rather than imagining rules or rights above it. Though, of course, some ideas were thrown into the mix at the time that prefigured today's human rights regime because the leaders of those revolutions were pressed to describe what the rule of law should look like in their new states. But they gazed inward in this struggle, in Moyne's view, not thinking internationally, and very much drawing their strength and their authority from the idea of a, of a strong and sovereign nation state. So you begin to see the differences with what we understand as human rights movement advocacy today. Even after the atrocities of World War II, in the aftermath of which today's human rights regime was created on paper, Moyne asserts that human rights as a framework for social change, and that's the key thing he wants to emphasize, were essentially born dead. In spite of the best work of the founding fathers and mothers of human rights, including the great Canadian statesman John Humphrey, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 was not picked up and used for advocacy for a very long time. The language of human rights remained alien in civil society. There was not an enormous amount of confidence in the UN as a vehicle for social change. The Cold War became entrenched and indeed greatly slowed the transformation of the Universal Declaration into the bedrock covenants of human rights that we have today, which didn't get through the General Assembly until 1966 and didn't come into force until 1976. In addition, in the 1950s and 1960s, the prevailing political struggle globally, you might say, was anti-colonialism. Anti-colonialist independence movements in the 20th century, as in the 18th, sometimes used human rights language, but again largely to serve a collective self-determination agenda. Arbitrary or inhuman use of the power of the colonial state was in the crosshairs, but not as against the rights of the individual person as such. 
It's an interesting story. But anyway, the British political scientist H.G. Nicholas, who held the Rhodes Chair of American Studies at Oxford University, uh, was, according to Moyne, not out of step with the social observers of the day when he wrote the following in the 1970s. I quote, nothing has done more harm to the UN than the great wild goose chase after human rights. No country is innocent in this matter, neither the US which pressed for human rights provisions in the UN Charter, nor the Soviet bloc which exploited them with a magnificent indifference to the beams in their own eyes, nor the Latin Americans who found here ideal nourishment for their rhetorical appetites. <laughs> yeah, right. Thus, a cowardly conspiracy developed to gloss over the inherent absurdity of an organization of governments dedicating itself to protect human rights when, in all ages and climes, it is governments who have been their principal violators, end quote. Well, yes. Um, so here we are in the early 1970s with um, the feeling that things have not gone all that well with, again, human rights as a vehicle for social change. So Samuel Moyne in this book makes what I think is an interesting case that the birth of the human rights movement as we think of it today started really uh, remarkably enough uh, soon after the, the quote that I just read you was, was made um, in the 1970s and that that birth arose partly uh, from the plights of Sakharov, of Solzhenitsyn, of the other Soviet dissidents whose stories became known in the West. That it arose from Amnesty International telling the individual stories of what it came to call prisoners of conscience. From accounts of individual lives destroyed by the dirty wars, the disappearances, and the dictatorships in Latin America. From the creation of Helsinki Watch, which became Human Rights Watch and from the creation especially of government departments with a human rights focus, both a domestic uh, focus and uh, programs in foreign ministries and human rights commissions of various kinds. Uh, Moyne sets these developments, as you can imagine, in the context of the bloom being off the rose of the world's various utopian or grand theory projects, oh I'm in Canada, I should say projects, right? The Cold War itself, communism, socialism in various versions, counterculture ideas of the 1960s, and anti-colonialism which faded as a unifying movement in the 1970s. And he goes on to recount, things happened quickly, Amnesty International got the Nobel Prize in 1977, Jimmy Carter was elected at the same time, uh, talks about um, talks about how then, after Jimmy Carter, who talked a lot about human rights but didn't get reelected, um, human rights then became exploited by Ronald Reagan and his allies, speaking of uh, Margaret Thatcher, in their ostensible promotion of democracy around the world, which in the US case, of course, turned out to be on behalf of the most craven interests of US corporations and neoconservative constituencies. So, a different reading of the history here. Moyne a further, and I like the way he talks about this, asserts that there is a minimalism at the core of human rights advocacy in the form of that human story. The story of an individual's suffering at the hands of the state or at the hands of an agent that the state should constrain. Confronting power one story at a time does not have that more macro or maximalist character of a political or a political economy paradigm. But that story by story minimalism, that core, is made more maximal, if you like, by the grievances recounted in the individual stories having recourse in the law that supersedes the law of the nation state. Together, in his view, these elements catalyze social change in a way that he characterizes as apolitical, which I think is only true to a point, but I think what he merely means is that it, it is more robust than paradigms that are tripped up by megalomaniac leaders or the weight of too many years of unfulfilled promise. Again, making international law real is a key to this idea. As he said, and I quote again, the human rights movement made international law a privileged instrument of moral improvement, of moral improvement, and indeed provided it enormous appeal as a framework for idealistic pursuits, unquote.
So whether we buy all of this or not, um, one aspect of this analysis that seems clear to me and in fact is echoed by many others, and you will know some of these accounts, is that the Cold War made it virtually impossible to go very far in building a movement around economic and social rights. Now, I pause to say that I think in this remarkably erudite audience, I maybe don't need to say anything about the historical distinction between economic, social, and cultural rights and civil and political rights, um, or that there is a strong consensus today that the historical wall between the two has indeed exaggerated differences, and it's not helpful, as we have found in today's movement, to separate them in the way that history might lead us to do. If you know all this, don't look at the slide. Um, the Soviet bloc's constant claim that its people did not want for anything material and its regular accusations of the inadequacy of social services in the West, notably in the US, made it unlikely that an emerging Western human rights movement was going to be able to go very far with economic and social rights in the Cold War period. And we can talk more later, if you like, about the slowness with which the big human rights organizations, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch especially, came to take on economic and social rights. Uh, some of you may know the very good book, The Keepers of the Flame by Ian Hopgood, that chronicles a little bit of Amnesty International's internal struggle on this point. Um, and good for Amnesty to have cooperated with him so that we have that story. And now Amnesty International is headed by somebody who is really known most for his work on ESC rights and speaks regularly of the wall between these two as a problematic thing, which I think is enormously beneficial to our movements today. With respect to the HIV and human rights movement then, and I will call it that, it is in retrospect, amazing to me that there was such facility with human rights as a framework and courage in using it when in fact in the early 1980s when a lot of this started, the precedents for this kind of thing were not many. And it's even more amazing in some ways that there were no complexes about in using t talking about economic and social rights along with any other kind of right. I don't think I appreciated all of this adequately at the time until I found myself leading this program at Human Rights Watch when I couldn't get Human Rights Watch's legal office to let me sign the organization's name on anything involving, for instance, access to medicines unless the statement made that the case that the problem wasn't just about poverty, it was also about discrimination. I found myself saying over and over again that with HIV we couldn't separate civil and political rights from uh, what Human Rights Watch's legal office kept calling distributive justice as though it were sort of a bad thing. Um, in other words, what does it profit a person to have human rights when there is no social justice? Well, that argument went on. The, the same idea that I was fighting with of this sort of second class status of ESC rights was put into a much criticized article by Ken Roth, the head of Human Rights Watch in 2004 in Human Rights Quarterly where he asserted again that the mainstream human, rights, mainstream human rights movement with its trademark name and shame methods was li unlikely to be able to do much with the economic and social rights part of the picture except where the violations in question were arbitrary or discriminatory rather than a matter of purely distributive justice. So this view also echoes his predecessor as the director of human rights, Arye Nair, a formidable human rights figure uh, of his generation, for sure. Nair stuck to the idea for a very long time that economic and social rights should not be construed as rights at all, but rather as national budget matters, which in a democratic society must be left to elected representatives of the people, and especially are not appropriately understood as matters of international law to which aggrieved individuals might turn. He now is really, I would say, very isolated in that view. But on, e on ESC rights, on talking about poverty and talking about the right to health, we've kind of heard it all. We've heard all the classic criticisms of these rights. They're too vague, they're too aspirational, they're too expensive, they're too unrealistic, it's too hard to identify the violator, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's too difficult to define what progressive realization means in concrete terms. Uh, some of those things should not be characterized as blah, 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 I know. It's an important debate. Um, 
that, yeah, and then we of course got the, the, the argument that was particularly targeted I think at the HIV world by our friend Professor William Easterly of NYU previously of the World Bank who said in a widely read article in the Financial Times that uh, justiciable human rights are the wrong framework for deciding allocation of resources to health and social services because those who will pursue rights claims by definition will not be the most marginalized people. This argument was in service of his principal smarmy crusade, which was arguing that HIV programs were overfunded. Um, and of, within the HIV world, we've had the constant tension, of course, from the early days of HIV testing and disclosure laws and regulations through to test and treat or treatment 2.0 or whatever UNPR name it has now, that to use the framework of individual rights subverts the public health measures that need to be taken for the greater good of society. None of us will soon forget the shadow over the continent argument of Dr. Kevin de Kock in 2004, then and now of the US CDC and in between at WHO, who regularly portrayed human rights protections around HIV testing as contrary to social justice. So sort of the flip side of the debate I was having at Human Rights Watch. As Richard Elliott said so astutely at the time, what kind of social justice is it that we think we're getting if it is without human rights? I don't know if you've seen the recent Global Fund paper on tuberculosis and human rights. It is the unmistakable child of the HIV and human rights movement. And if the Global Fund and the CCMs take it seriously, it will influence the design of millions of dollars worth of TB programs. The Open Society Foundation, where I work now, has grant programs that are rig rigorously human rights oriented in such areas as deinstitutionalization de of mental health patients, palliative care, rights of people who use drugs and sex workers to health services, health issues in prison and pretrial detention, accountability and health budgeting, um, access to health services for Roma and other severely marginalized groups, and access to legal services related to health care, the last program being run by Ralph Jurgens. The history of HIV, the HIV and human rights struggle is behind the design of every single one of these multi-million dollar programs, and obviously is also part of the experience of a lot of us who are working on them. Stephen Marks at Harvard, who worked a lot with Jonathan Mann and has been a long time at the matter of health and human rights, said in the late 1990s when Mann died that the field of health and human rights was developed with respect to only three issues, HIV, reproductive health, and health problems, health effects of torture. <laughs> By contrast, the program of the Harvard Short Course on Health and Human Rights this year will include these topics, and I won't read them. Uh, this is, by the way, not a pretense that this is a comprehensive look at health and human rights. It's obviously determined partly by the specialties and the expertise of the Harvard faculty. There's no question, though, that the broadening of this field of health and human rights owes a great deal to the energy with which human rights advocacy was used in the struggle against HIV and continues to be. That the broadening also includes, at least on an academic plane, a tie to the Millennium Development Goals, uh, closely linked, obviously, to poverty and development, to me is also very important, and I'd like to come back to that, too. So again, we've understood for a long time that the most severe and intransigent HIV epidemics are among uh, people who are subject to what I consider to be ill-conceived criminal laws, that is, people who use drugs, particularly where minor drug offenses are heavily criminalized, sex workers, particularly where sex work is criminalized, or where sex workers are subject to arbitrary and excessive arrest and detention under non-criminalized statute, uh, non-criminal statutes, which happens a lot, and obviously among men who have sex with men and transgender people particularly where anything outside heteronormal sexuality is criminalized or heavily stigmatized. The epidemiological evidence at a macro level of severe epidemics following the pattern of harsh application of these laws is striking, not perfect, it's striking. It would undoubtedly help us to have more studies like the one by Stephanie Strathdee and her colleagues in Ukraine uh, 
that were able to make quantitative estimates of the amount of new HIV infection that could be averted if policing were less repressive and people were less fearful of seeking health services. So this problem that brings many of you here this weekend, the criminalization of non-disclosure of HIV status or HIV exposure transmission, however we capture it, does perhaps not have the same epidemiological punch as some of these other misapplications of criminal law because perhaps fewer people are affected, but then, as many of you have shown in your work, it is hard to know the real impact of these laws because it's so hard to measure the effect of the stigma that comes, for example, from press coverage of high, a few high-profile cases. In any case, these laws have a remarkable staying power after years of research, analysis, and advocacy, this is a topic that leaves even an august institution like the Canadian Supreme Court apparently completely spooked. Um, I know that there will be great brilliance in the workshops in this weekend as you look at the tricky legal questions that are raised what criminal intent means when the weapon in question is consensual sex, indeed the meaning of consent under the law in these cases, the forensic challenge of determining the moment of infection, the meaning of sexual assault in law, and that's a term that we must have a, a rigorous meaning for, for the real cases of sexual assault, and so on. And I really applaud you for the work that will be done and that has been done in the elegance of your analyses. Rather than comment on any of those aspects, though, which so many of you are more qualified to opine on, I would simply like to suggest that from the rich experience we have of HIV and health-related human rights advocacy in these 25 or 30 years, that there may be a few lessons that we might usefully bring to our thinking on transmission slash exposure slash non-disclosure law and jurisprudence. Um, and uh, maybe I'm entering into a, an analogy that's not very good, but you are working here with a body of law that appears in many ways to be irrational, but perhaps its rationality is not so easy to discern. That is certainly what I would say about the body of law and law enforcement practice that we would refer to in shorthand as the war on drugs which we know by any measure related to its ostensible objectives is ineffective, irrational, and wasteful. Drugs are more plentiful and cheaper than ever in every place that pursues with aggressive policing and harsh laws the unrealistic goal of a drug-free society. But if anyone looks closely at this history, the rationality of this beast indeed becomes clear. The case of the U.S. is best studied, but by no means unique. Measures taken in the name of drug control in the U.S. have been partly about drugs, perhaps, but also about targeting unpopular minorities, such as the Chinese railroad workers in the 19th century, about smearing African Americans in the early 20th century, and then, of course, in the wake of important civil rights legislation in the U.S. in the 1960s, when blacks needed to be put in their place again, the horrific mass incarceration of African Americans that is only now beginning to be addressed in some U.S. states with any seriousness and being understood for the full extent of the social crisis it has caused by the important work of Michelle Alexander and others. Um, which again, I encourage uh, you to know better. Indeed, also the role of poverty in this crisis, the fact that the drug war has been both a race war and a class war, has not really been well understood until recently. If in this work from, in this, these numbers from the work of Bruce Western of Harvard, we understand education as a HS here in the graph is high school, if we understand education as a proxy for poverty or for wealth, if you like, we begin to get the picture. And we get a similar picture about Roma in many parts of Europe and about poor people and migrants and unfavored minorities in other parts of the world. Analysis like this has helped us, those of us who work on drug policy reform, to change attitudes about the drug war to some degree, though of course this is a long battle. And I hasten to say that the progress that we are seeing 
on drug law reform globally is due in very large part to the spotlight that was shown on drug policy by the connection between HIV and drug injection. Again, I know that the analogy is not perfect to the problem at hand to sexual transmission of HIV, but when, when the story of criminalization of HIV transmission is finally told, and the sad compendium of cases is seen country by country in historical perspective, will we be moved to conclude that part of what motivated these laws was really not anything having to do much to do with HIV transmission, that part of it was racism, that part of it was xenophobia, that part of it was homophobia, that part of it was discrimination, pure moral judgmentalism against people who have sex outside marriage or are otherwise somehow judged to be promiscuous. Or discrimination against people who use drugs because they get caught up in these laws too and they hardly need another reason to be put in jail. Again, I really admire all of the papers that were posted on the, on the website for the workshop, but with regard to these questions, I really am grateful to see the paper by Trevor Hoppe, who's here with us tonight from the University of Michigan, which brings the data on prosecutions and convictions in Michigan's HIV non-disclosure laws um, brings to those some of what we have understood from the work of Michelle Alexander and others with respect to the race war behind drug-related mass incarceration, so thank you for that work. Seeing these various discrimination agendas that may be in, at play in these laws is already a full play in human rights terms, but here again I think poverty has to come into the picture. What will be the story that history tells about poverty and the prosecution of HIV transmission and non-disclosure? In how many of the cases that go forward will we find that the defendant was a rich person with good access to high quality counsel? I, I think we are really at a matter of reckon, at a time of reckoning in the world where the injustice of poverty must be addressed by a marrying of anti-poverty and human rights advocacy of the kind that we really haven't seen too much of. And in this, I, I really think that the HIV and human rights community has a lot to offer. We witnessed a Millennium Development Declaration from the UN General Assembly in 2000 that was heavy with human rights language followed quickly by Millennium Development Goals, most of them related to health and poverty, that for the most part did not reflect the idea that justice and poverty reduction must go hand in hand. And no surprise, since they were cooked up behind closed doors in the classic smoke-filled rooms in a process that belies everything that we learned in the HIV struggle. We're now beset by a messy process that is meant to define post-2015 objectives in which many players are striving to ensure that human rights norms are meaningfully embodied in these new goals, should there be new goals, and of course others are pushing back. Lack of access to justice among the poor across the world is a crisis. There are many ways in which we, in the HIV and human rights world, need to join with anti-poverty activists, and one of them should be building greater awareness and even a movement about the links between poverty and criminal prosecutions, both that poverty results from criminalization and from having a criminal record, but also that poverty impedes access to justice in the face of a criminal charge. I know this is banal, but I think it's worth our attention. It's almost 50 years ago to the day that the U.S. Supreme Court, then the Warren Court, in the case of Gideon v. Wainwright, decided unanimously that people who can't afford a private lawyer in the U.S. are nonetheless entitled to one so that they may stand equal before the law. These 50 years later, especially taking into account that 95% of criminal prosecutions in the U.S. take place in state and not federal courts. The degree to which Gideon is implemented is grossly deficient, and there are way too many human stories to tell. I was reading about a young man in Texas who was accused of a capital crime in the factory of death that is the criminal justice system of the state of Texas, who requested a lawyer on the day of his arrest and got one eight months later. In the same state, people sentenced to die, even though overworked and undercompensated attorneys appointed by the court mounted defenses, 
without ever knowing that their clients had brain damage or intellectual disabilities. Underpaid and overworked court-appointed lawyers who say that their normal interaction with their clients across the country, not just in Texas, is 30 seconds to explain a plea deal. And that's just in the US where there are laws about these things. And this is the kind of work that Ralph Jurgens is addressing around the world with his program. Commentators on this 50th anniversary of Gideon in the US noted that public funding for legal services is hard to get, partly because in the public mind, the criminal courts are understood to deal mostly with people of color. As the great Patricia Williams of Columbia Law School wrote recently in The Nation, we must find some capacity to be shocked by, quote, the degree to which race and geography, closely linked as they are to poverty, have become an overly capacious proxy for narratives of criminality. So going back to Moyne's formulation, I think perhaps we need to hear the stories of abuse in a more complete way and respect their integrity with more humility. I'm ashamed to think of the number of times that I heard people's testimony when I was talking to drug users, sex workers, people with HIV, where I wanted to hear something in particular, a particular form of discrimination or a particular kind of police abuse, when the story in front of me clearly was about a person who didn't know where the next meal was coming from. So our minimalist enterprise will be made more maximal, I think, not only by making international law as binding as it can be, but also by understanding that the beating heart of human rights advocacy in today's world is so often the fight against the indignity of poverty. All of the forms of discrimination that we talk about in our work, all of the impacts of ill-conceived criminal law, all of the moral judgmentalism, all of it falls hardest on the poor. I was going to open a parenthesis about sexual, Did we have a little time yet? Okay. Um, well, I apologize for this slide because it's, I couldn't find a less blurry uh, picture of this, but with respect to sex and moral judgmentalism, which really is a part of, of what you're fighting against, I wanted to open a parenthesis a little bit that you may or may not find relevant. Moral judgment um, with respect to sex, maybe even more than with respect to drugs, may be the hardest nut to crack of all, and we have a hard time with it in the human rights movement. I've noticed that the journal Health and Human Rights has included a number of pieces in recent years that make reference to the sexual hierarchy framework of the University of Michigan anthropologist Gail Rubin. This is a hierarchy of social approval of forms of sex. You know this story, do you? Well, I'll tell you, tell you what I know. Um, the, the, the idea is that there are socially acceptable, even necessary forms of sex at the top of the hierarchy where society approves of them and other kinds at the bottom. So in this framework, based more or less, I guess, on, on North American mores as interpreted by Rubin, the pinnacle of approved sex, now listen closely, is, is heterosexual sex in a heterosexual marriage, procreative and not casual or recreational, um, two people, two people, in the bedroom, door closed, standard positions, whatever that means, unaided by sex toys or other mechanical devices, pornography or cameras, and the two persons are more or less of the same generation. There is no exchange of money. Apparently this sort of thing exists somewhere. <laughs> And as we go lower in the hierarchy, we find, well, you know, the opposite. Um, I raise this only, um, not, not only because I, I think it's actually fiendishly clever and hilarious, but because even here we see that we need to think about poverty too. Because if we're talking about the poor, forget procreation, I mean, that's not so much on, is it? The social correctness of, of pro procreation is not for them. And no one will care, of course, that the poor or those driven to desperation by addiction may rationally find that selling sex is the best livelihood option that they have. On that point, too, we see that the hierarchy can be challenged, as difficult as it may be, and it can be challenged with the aid of human rights mechanisms and tools. In the 1990s, as HIV became a social fact of life in India, sex workers were finding a platform for their individual stories, 
as well as their collective voice, even as the feminist movement in that country was, alas, not inclined generally to see them as anything but enslaved. Sex workers nonetheless embodying a stunning example of life-saving solidarity, very much again aided in a way by, the, by the, the attention that HIV brought to them and to their ability to say that they were part of the solution and not part of the problem of HIV. If they did not actually raise themselves higher on the social approval scale, they at least made their voice an important one politically that can counter the prevailing social finger wagging. Their success was achieved partly by prying open the space for a political discussion about the feminization of poverty and the exclusion of women from respectable livelihood options. End of parenthesis. Well, I think that may be enough, in fact. In a speech a couple of years ago at Human Rights Watch, Professor David Petrasik of the University of Ottawa was asked to address the question of what the next big thing is for the human rights movement in a world of increasing poverty and economic inequality, planetary destruction and the, the denial of it, uh, the end of the welfare state, the continuing love affair of the powerful with counter-terrorism measures that embody scorn for civil liberties. His answer was that the next big thing for human rights is in fact human rights, or bringing the best of a robust human rights movement to all of these global challenges. I don't know if that's too glib an answer and certainly one that appeals to me for obvious reasons, but the answer probably can't be right unless we make maximalist the use of our tools by joining with anti-poverty movements, unless there is more openness in the human rights movement to real evaluation and scrutiny on which it has been weak in my view, unless we are sincere about and invest in the kinds of north-south partnerships that are exemplified by the access to medicines movement unless we develop even, an even more keen sense of responsibility to the integrity of the story of those most hurt by abuses, and probably also unless we recognize the limits of the human rights framework and the limits of international law, even as we strive to overcome them. I have not come back to the thought of religious fundamentalists in power. As a final word, I guess I'd like to borrow from a 12th century voice on that subject, somebody who knew a lot about fanaticism and fundamentalism. From Omar Khayyam via the Richard Le Gallienne paraphrase, this quatrain from the Rubaiyat. And do you think that unto such as you, a maggot-minded, starved, fanatic crew, God gave a secret and denied it me? Well, well, what matters it? Believe that too. In standing up to all of the moral judgmentalism, fanaticism, the looking down on the poor, and the easy exclusions of our age, I wish you all great courage and a good workshop this weekend too. Thank you very much.